Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Thursday, January 12th, 2012, and our special guest is Mitch Perlstein, author of From Family Collapse to America's Decline. Mitch, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. So uh, Mitch is on the telephone coming through, so there might be a slight lag between uh, when he finishes speaking and I start or when I finish speaking and he starts, um, but we're sure glad to have him on. And that also means he can't see the screen, he can't see your questions in the chat, but I will try and relay them to him. The Future of Education is sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project, web20labs.com, and by Blackboard Collaborate and the new uh, user community for Collaborate that I run at wecollaborate.com. Coming up, please do note if you're going to the ISTE Technology Conference this summer, we have the ISTE Unplugged set of activities. This is really, really fun. It starts with Social Ed Con, the Saturday before an all-day unconference on social media and education. Uh, we have a number of really fun activities planned, including the three-day Bloggers Cafe and ISTE Live. If, you, if you've always wanted to present at ISTE and haven't been accepted or for some other reason, aren't an official presenter, we let you do that. Anyway, istiunplugged.com. Uh, also, we've just announced Ed Incubator, a place for small educational startups to get uh, authentic teacher councils. Our first customer is PBS NewsHour. Uh, please go to edincubator.com or in classroom20.com, you can click on the Ed Incubator link. Lots of fun there. If you always wanted to let somebody know how you feel as an educator, go let PBS know. And we have some other really fun organizations lined up. Coming up uh, this year in our worldwide conferences, uh, we are going to do a special celebration of Classroom 2.0's fifth anniversary. We have a gaming and education conference on April 26th planned. The alternate education conference, which would be homeschooling, unschooling, and the like, is May 16th to 18th. We are going to include online learning in that. Uh, the Future of Libraries Conference is October 3rd through the 5th, and the Global Education Conference will be the 12th to the 16th of November. Coming up on the show next week, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach talks about her book, The Connected Educator. Henry Eyring about his book with uh, Clay Christensen on the Innovative University. Uh, obviously, lots more. Uh, you can see that long list of interviews coming up. New to as of today, David Weinberger is going to be talking on February 28th about his book, Too Big to Know. Um, Joseph Granny from Vital Smarts is going to come on and talk about crucial conversations, vital behaviors, and sources of influence. And our friend Jennifer Fox is going to return um, to, to talk about to heck with traditional content. Uh, Jennifer is a strengths-based educator uh, in Texas starting a new school. It should be very fun to follow her progress. Anyway, lots of diversity. We hope that you enjoy that in the show. Uh, here's a list of many of the past guests. I think we're at over 225 so far, but all of those recordings are up online um, and available in recorded form, both in full Illuminate version and in MP3, uh, including, I'm going to make sure, um, Frederick Hess, who's been on the show, and also several people you mentioned in the book have been on, uh, Chubb and Mo, Mo and Chubb, and uh, Clay, uh, Clayton Christensen's co-author, um, Michael Horn has been on several times. Anyway, lots of fun. Yeah, you're mentioning you're mentioning at least five folks who are uh, good friends. I'm sure. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, here's your chance to let us know where you're participating from. You can do that by clicking on the star. It's the second icon down, and then clicking on the map. I'm hoping I've given you all permissions. You do have permissions. So it looks like we've got New Zealand. Uh, Bill is here again. <laughs> well, you're such a stalwart attendee. Thank you for doing such a good job representing the Southeast Asia or the Far East or whatever we're going to call it. You give you you keep making us a global audience, and it's much appreciated. Feel free to also put in the chat where you're participating from. I expected a kind of an American-centric audience tonight, but they're U.S.-centric. Well, happy to talk with everyone. Yes, and so wherever you're listening from, and uh, if you're listening to the recording, we're sure glad to have you here and and uh, being a part of this. So, uh, Mitch, uh, if there were ever a book written that was expecting a negative response, 
but worked really thoughtfully throughout and took great pains to be balanced. I feel like it's this book. Um, was this a hard book to write? I appreciate that very much. Um, I did a blog the other day, interestingly. Uh, I was asked to participate in uh, the Marriage Scholars blog uh, sponsored by the Institute for American Values in New York. And the headline was, Where Have All the Dirty Names Gone? I have been uh, working in this area, questions of family breakdown, the new term of art is family fragmentation, going back truly to the 1970s. And people simply assume I get called dirty names all the time, picking the top two sexist and racist. And the fact of the matter is I really haven't. And where this book uh, more specifically is concerned, it has been out since uh, August, September. I've been on national radio about four times. I've been in various national publications at least three times and fully accepting the fact that everybody in this world has not seen the book. I have yet to be called one dirty name. Um, I'm assuming that it has something to do with the fact that the book is uh, written fairly, and we can come back to that. But I also believe that there are enough people out there now who are more than frightened enough uh, about uh, family collapse in the United States and how it affects not just education but every conceivable measure, uh, that they are less inclined to... Uh, be nasty towards people who uh, raise the subject. And was it a hard book to write? Uh, I would say not any harder than any book because they are all hard to write. <laughs> so I am intrigued because the uh, you know it feels like at least in the United States um, we uh, tend to have conversations that are that are highly divisive. Uh, and yet conversations around the family seem to bridge what might be called both liberal and conservative perspectives. So um, have you, um, I'm guessing that's a part of it as well. Not only is it well written, but I'm also guessing that, the, that you're right, that this is an issue shared by all of us and not easily categorized. I, I would hope so. Uh, I got a call a couple of weeks ago from uh, a progressive journalist. Uh, she would indeed describe herself as liberal, and she sounds as if I'm boasting. She left a voicemail saying that she was riveted by the book, and we got together for an interview, and she was just taken back about how non judgmental uh, I've been, and I would like to think that is true. And when it comes to education more specifically, uh, it is indeed true that I, uh, I'm not terrifically supportive of what teacher unions do when it comes to making progress educationally in the United States. But I really don't think there is one negative comment about uh, teachers in the, uh, in the entire book. I make it real clear their jobs are very, very difficult, and they have talents that I do not have. Yeah, I mean, at one point, I think you even say in the book that you feel like the issue of teachers' union, any teachers' unions, is um, really can be put in the back seat if your thesis is correct, right? Uh, the argument there is that, and I learned this from Paul Peterson uh, a good number of years ago, you step back and you realize that the job of a teacher's union, the job of any union, is to protect its members, first and foremost. If they're not doing that, they're not exercising their fiduciary responsibility. So if you accept that, you don't get all riled up. You may get upset that uh, they're standing in the way of something that you would like to do. But I can tell you also, in Minnesota, I can point to various uh, uh, steps, reforms, if you will, over the last uh, 25 years now uh, in education where the teacher unions have been opposed. Uh, but those of us who have fought for open enrollments and charter schools and uh, tax credits for educational expenses and a couple of other things. We've won, and uh, not necessarily completely, but uh, the unions have not prevailed on those questions. Uh, the unions are not invincible. 
So while the topic may not have been as divisive as I assumed and maybe others would have, um, you do make the point that it's often not talked about. Does this qualify as an elephant in the room kind of an issue, family fragmentation, when it comes to education? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I would argue that um, if you go back to the Moynihan Report on the breakdown of black family, which he wrote in 1965, and he was pilloried, and that uh, upwards of the next two decades, public conversation was just about verboten, and has gotten uh, progressively better since then, but by no stretch of the imagination is it adequate. And one of my favorite examples, uh, Richard Rothstein is a wonderful education writer, used to be at the New York Times, and he wrote a book about a half dozen years ago called Class and Schools. And in some ways, he makes the argument from the left that I make from the right, and that is as long as we have so much poverty and chaos in the lives of kids, we can have all the no-child-left-behind policies in the world, and they will not make an adequate difference. The problem is, by my lights, uh, there are no more than two oblique references in his entire book to family breakdown. It's as if all these families that are poor are poor just because. Well, uh, they're poor for a number of reasons, but a very large reason is um, lots of kids born out of wedlock, lots of divorce, and we have to uh, attend to these matters better. Uh, this is just such a fascinating topic. So I interviewed a woman named Vicki Abelles who's made a movie called The Race to Nowhere. And my guess is that you and Vicki might not agree on the end goals of education, but that you would agree on uh, many aspects of the uh, issues about the family. And I bring it up because uh, in interviewing her, I mentioned that um, I was particularly impressed by the images of family dinners that were being held in her home uh, with the kids and the research that I had seen about the correlation between families that eat together and academic achievement. And Vicki said something surprising to me at the time. She said, of all of the interviews I've done, no one has brought that up. What's at the core of the reluctance to talk about that, do you think? Um, why would the discussion of family breakdown be a hard thing to, to be candid about? Well, first of all, as alluded to before, you, uh, it's not going to happen every day, but you can be called uh, sexist, you can be called racist, and it's a sign of progress in this country where the most damning thing, the most painful thing a person can be called is uh, racist. Uh, so it's perverse progress in this respect. Beyond that, though, um, just about everybody is in a situation where either they are divorced, uh, children are divorced, parents are divorced, good friends are divorced, uh, people close to them are having babies, have had babies out of wedlock, and it is just uncomfortable. If you start from the fact that about 40% of all American marriages, uh, first marriages end in divorce, and the number is closer to 50% for subsequent marriages. Let's say you're at a dinner party with a dozen people. <laughs> that means at least, generally speaking, half the people around the room have been divorced, and they may or may not uh, welcome uh, that conversation. Fascinating. It also seems like in the book you... Um, that you claim as a cause of some of this, or a great portion of it, um, kind of the selfishness of adults. And I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind of a me-first culture, and that may be a little bit hard for us to recognize and reflect on. Yeah, I'm uh, generally reluctant to sound arrogant uh, along the lines of, well, you folks, you're you're just selfish, but in this instance, uh, and one of the ways I put it, I don't want to sound like a Time or a Newsweek uh, cover story, but it is indeed true. If you go back to a wonderful piece of writing, uh, the book New Rules by the pollster Daniel Yankelovich book came out about 1982, and based on interviews, based on survey data, other things, it was clear that coming out of the 60s into the 70s into the 80s, things had, had changed that uh, in previous decades, 
Uh, one could talk about being a good family man. People weren't that affluent. They took care of their families. That was that was at the core of the, the lives of many, many people. And if you want to stick it in Maslowian terms, uh, coming out of the 60s, 70s, and to the 80s, uh, because of a changing culture, because of uh, more affluence, people sought to express themselves, to self-actualize themselves. I'm getting a little poetic here, but you get the idea. Um, and I would, let's take it one step uh, further. When it comes to bringing babies into this world by, let's say, scientific methods, I would make the case, and fully recognizing how sensitive a subject that this is, and if one wants to have a child, and, uh, and if you're not in a good marriage situation or you're having biological uh, difficulties, um, the idea of going to great lengths quite often to make a baby, uh, is, I would argue, is in the best interest uh, of, of the adults, not necessarily the children. And uh, of course, there's a more than a dotted line connection here to same-sex marriage, a subject I try real hard to avoid. Well, I'm interested in the selfishness aspect because, uh, for me at least, it feels as though um, you can um, you can be divorced or have gone through difficult circumstances, but still be highly devoted to doing the right thing for your children. And so it feels as though that a allows well, you to, to make a sort of a better connection here. Um, I'm also intrigued by the fact that my father describes his growing up in such a way as to leave me with the impression that he grew up... Um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, um, that his parent, that he was almost sort of ignored as a child. He had sort of free roam of the neighborhood. The other adults often corrected him from their porch. Um, but uh, I'm intrigued also sort of by the contrast that, uh, that I have of the sense of duty and obligation, but also feeling as though um, there was maybe less time devoted to the kinds of things that we equate with parenting today. And how does that reconcile? Oh, there's no question about that. Uh, my father, who died about a dozen years ago, was a salesman. He was an assistant manager, a manager of a sporting goods store. And because he was in retail, he worked uh, ridiculous hours. I played uh, organized baseball growing up. I played organized basketball growing up. I seem to remember him and my mother coming to one of the games as opposed to... Uh, parents to the, these days frequently going to all of their kids' games if, they're, if their uh, schedules allow. Uh, I'm bigger on the sense of duty to one's family than uh, spending a lot of what might be called is called quality time. Uh, you may remember in the book, I, I make it clear uh, later in the book that uh, I'm talking a lot about fathers, but my conception of what I would like them to do is really quite modest. The old Woody Allen line about 80% of life is showing up. I just want them there, not every moment. They don't have to go to all the ball games, but in in the household. And if uh, they don't want to uh, change diapers in the way that modern men should, I would hope that they would. But uh, it is no great crime. It's, it's an issue that they have to work out between their God and their wives. <laughs> So I want, I want to go into kind of the argument of the book, um, but before I do so, one of the questions that I kept asking myself as I read it is, how much of this is a part of an historical cycle? And if we think about cycles in history and we think about ways in which, you know, uh, you get the, the Roaring Twenties and then the Great Depression, is there a degree to which some of what you're describing here is related to historical cycles, or is this, does this sit outside of those cycles, and are we seeing something just unprecedented in terms of particularly fatherless families? I believe so. Uh, at least families that are fatherless, not by uh, means of uh, death. Uh, I fully accept the fact, uh, obviously, that over the decades and over the centuries, uh, marriage has changed. Um, different conceptions of romantic love, if in fact romantic love was even in the equation, but I don't know of any time in which, for example, in the United States, and the United States has the highest family fragmentation rates in the industrialized world where 
uh, 30% of white children are born out of wedlock. 40% of the nation as a whole, I'm rounding off here, about 50% of Hispanic babies are born out of wedlock. The number is over 70%. Last I heard, 72% for African Americans. And we were just talking about divorce. Uh, Marriage is breaking up 40% of the time, 50% of the time. I simply don't know of any parallel situation. Okay, so the basic argument that I heard is that that family fragmentation is actually at the heart of of our educational crises or our lack of achievement, that the, however we describe that. That. Um, the, the, the litany of educational improvement projects over the last 40 or 50 years would show that no matter how hard we're trying, that it's very hard from a policy level to, to actually solve what's a cultural crisis, and that this is having an impact yeah, on I don't us. Want, Go ahead. Yeah, I don't want to um, claim, I, I certainly don't claim that family breakdown is the single largest uh, reason why American education is, is wanting. Do I believe, however, that it is a significant problem? Absolutely. Okay, so good clarification. And, and, and a significant problem that often doesn't get discussed um, in, in the ways that we hope to talk about it tonight. Okay, so how did we get Correct. here? Well, uh, I have, uh, for, the, for the better part of the last number of decades, and as I think I may have mentioned before, I started writing about this in the late 1970s. I would make an argument similar to others talking about the economic uh, reasons and the cultural reasons and the policy reasons, the economic reasons, uh, including the William Julius Wilson concession of unmarriageable men because of the loss of family wage jobs for low-skilled men in, in uh, poor cities. From another direction, one could talk about how uh, women now can support themselves in ways that they could not in the past, uh, making marriage less uh, necessary in, in some instances. The cultural side, uh, just turn on television. Uh, I, I love the examples, if you folks remember uh, Diana Ross's Love Child which came out in about the mid-1960s about how she had been a love child. This is all in euphemism. Her uh, boyfriend wanted to have sex. She didn't want to do that because she was afraid of making another love child. And she had grown up in shame, uh, and she wasn't going to do that to another child. Or Wake Up Little Susie, the Everly Brothers, is my other favorite example. And on the policy side, and conservatives are generally quick to going to uh, welfare policies that, while put in place with the best of intentions, have made matters worse in many respects, again, by uh, making men superfluous uh, and doing more to uh, break up families than to uh, secure them. Those are the three main arguments, and uh, uh, the numbers started getting bad, uh, at least in the African-American community in the 1960s. And Pat Moynihan uh, wrote about the subject then, and any number of events and publications and controversies, Dan Quayle was right, and the rest uh, over the next uh, almost half century now. So, so what have been the impacts of that fragmentation? Can we identify them specifically? Are they tangible, or is there research that would show that this fragmentation is um, really a, a making a difference in areas that we care about? Uh, overwhelming uh, evidence, overwhelming difference, and the book focuses on education, but not education alone. I would argue, and no one has challenged me on this, that there simply isn't a measure, be it educational performance, mental health, criminal activity, drug use, early pregnancy, there simply isn't a measure which isn't affected by uh, family breakdown. Now, it's very important to offer a couple caveats at, at, at this point. Are there <coughs> excuse me, millions of kids growing up in really tough situations who are doing great in this country? Absolutely. Are there millions of kids growing up under supposedly ideal situations 
who are doing terribly? Absolutely. But on decided average, it is far better for a kid to grow up with his own or her own married biological parents under the uh, under the same roof. So one of the guests we've had on the show is a man named John Taylor Gatto, who was um, a New York City school teacher who ended up writing a book called Dumbing Us Down and became um, something of a cult figure in the homeschool movement. But he talks a lot about the history of education in the United States. And one of the claims that he makes is that there was actually um, almost a conspiracy to break up the family that uh, corporations benefited so much from having two wage earners uh, in the family that there was an economic, a compelling economic reason to um, have uh, women go to work. Now, if you balance that against the, the women's movement and the right to vote and, and some of the things that we would now say were really critically important, how do we come to some kind of a historical context that allows us to see both the value in uh, increased rights for women, but a loss in terms of the family. First of all, I'm about the least conspiratorial person in the world. So anytime anybody argues, and frankly, again, and I'm a person of the right, this argument is made more frequently on the right than on the left, but perhaps <laughs> I'm gathering on the left as well. Uh, there isn't any institutions, aren't any institutions in the United States that have worked over time to uh, break up families, uh, it is simply, it is simply uh, uh, not true. I would, it's a good question that you raise. I do think you know, lots of people can indeed have two uh, serious thoughts on this at the same time. One, uh, they um, understand how we have gotten to this uh, point. Um, they understand the importance of uh, women being free to do uh, what they would like to do, but at the same time uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, this really isn't good for kids quite often. Um, it's complex by definition. The question then becomes, well, what do we do about it? And uh, no one seems to have a real good uh, route towards uh, making certain that larger numbers uh, of kids get to grow up with their uh, parents, two biological parents. And I say this, I'm an adoptive uh, father, so life again is, is complicated. Well, I don't want to skip to the end, but I am, there's a question I want to ask at this point, because in the book you use the uh, phrase um, uh, or the word paternalism in a, in a positive way, and oftentimes we hear that used in a more pejorative way. But it also occurred to me that you can have, uh, if we create a, an environment at schools that respects and reflects the need for the kind of community and authority and structure, that uh, have existed uh, in, in traditional families. Um, but we would also recognize that families often operate very differently. And, uh, and we have schools that provide that same sense, but often have very different outcomes. I'm thinking of, say, KIPP school versus big picture schools, where, where both create a real sense of um, some kind of belonging for the students, but have very different outcomes. So is it fair to think that, uh, that that we can still be using this language and be thinking about these problems without necessarily agreeing on what the outcomes are? I'm very much of a pluralist when it comes to American education, different strokes for different folks. I've been very much involved in school choice activities in this instance, going back to the uh, 1980s. Uh, I don't uh, focus in the book on, well, I do talk about some specific programs, but the argument is not, well, this is the way it should be done. I'm saying there are different approaches and that when it comes to uh, kids with uh, holes in their hearts, as uh, has been just, some have uh, described kids growing up with out of parent, 
I do believe that uh, rigor is important. Uh, paternalism is frequently used in this regard in a very good way. When it comes to schools, you mentioned the KIPP academies, uh, uh, very directive, uh, embracing uh, high standards and the like. I'm looking right now, I just got it off my shelf, Sweating the Small Stuff by uh, uh, David uh, Whitman. Um, I am not going to argue that, and I certainly don't, that there is only one or even only two or only three ways of helping kids growing up in tough situations. I'm real big, for example, on uh, school choice that includes parochial schools. Uh, what I would say is that many times uh, the approaches that we are taking to help poor kids, minority kids, uh, are ways that don't work, that uh, I would argue actually make uh, matters worse. So can we talk briefly about um, sort of tangible, specific research on the impact of marriage on educational achievement. But what, what have you learned over the years in this regard, uh, specifically the, the connection between um, marriage and family and educational achievement? Well, uh, let's, let's do it this way. I, I mentioned the Moynihan Report a, a couple of times. Uh, Pat Moynihan, when he was an assistant secretary of labor in the Johnson administration wrote this report about the breakdown of uh, the black family uh, in 65 using census data from 63 and at that time 23.6 percent of black children were born out of wedlock it's now about 72 percent and I assure folks there wasn't a racist punctuation mark in that report. It was an entirely uh, exquisitely progressive uh, document. It laid the conceptual foundation, for example, for affirmative action. Well, um, he was beaten up so by uh, members of his own administration, journalists, liberal community, civil rights uh, community, and the like that in many ways, at least my argument is, upwards of uh, 20 years until Bill Moyers in 1984 did a very important, very brave uh, documentary on CBS about uh, black families. Very little was said publicly. Having said that, quietly in libraries and offices and so forth, there were a number of uh, academics who were doing research on uh, what the effects of uh, fatherlessness or single parenthood was on kids. And there was an assumption on the part of uh, a number of scholars back then that the real problem was poverty, it wasn't family structure. But over that time and in succeeding years, and the research that I focus on in the book is all since, and all peer reviewed, all since uh, the year 2000, so this is all new. But uh, folks started, scholars started to discover that uh, there was a real live effect on uh, educational performance, and as I was saying before, on just about uh, everything else. Uh, one of the great breakthrough books uh, was uh, by Sarah McClanahan and Gary uh, Sandifer. The uh, uh, name is escaping me uh, uh, right now. But these were very brave, uh, progressive scholars who, as I understand the story, uh, assumed that poverty uh, alone was essentially the problem, but they came to understand that uh, family structure uh, is, is critical. More recently, uh, dancing around this, I, I suspect I'm not, I don't want to sound too pedantic and uh, start doing a lot of citations, but there was a, an educational testing service paper uh, that came out just in the last year or two, and I'm looking for the citation here, uh, written by two quite uh, enlightened, progressive uh, scholars. And let me read you the, uh, I have it right here, um, the, um, the opening lines or one of the uh, key lines of, um, of their study. And they said, it is very hard. Two sober scholars, who we'll return to later in the chapter, concluded in a 2010 educational testing service report 
to imagine progress resuming and reducing the education uh, attainment and achievement gap without turning these family trends around, by which they meant increasing marriage rates and getting fathers back into the business of nurturing children. The very idea, they said, of a substitute for the institution of marriage for raising children is almost unthinkable although they did add that stronger support for the family is not. Uh, there are many scholars, I gather, who, uh, sociologists, psychologists, they do the heavy-duty empirical work, they come up with the conclusions which uh, show that kids growing up uh, in these tougher situations on average do less well, and then they, they're not really happy with the results that they have found, but they are uh, uh, professional enough to, to report them. So uh, if we accept the thesis and, and, the, um, and the conclusions of this research, uh, is part of the awkwardness that it's really hard to know what to do, um, uh, especially given the iron law of evaluation and the brass law of evaluation? Uh, do we feel like uh, sometimes is it maybe easier to um, to move forward in certain ways because we believe that we can do something, where, where here we may feel a little less less capable of actually impacting this? I think there are lots of folks who uh, deep down believe that very significant progress is always five minutes away with a, a new approach, a, a new project. I, I, I just don't believe that. I wish it were true, but I... I uh, don't believe it, uh, but we have to do things. We have we have to try. Uh, the best example for me along these lines is early childhood education. Uh, do I think that many of the claims made in the name of early childhood education about how it will make lives and educational performance so much better? Do I think many of those claims are exaggerated? Absolutely. But there are lots of endangered kids out there, and it seems to me, without uh, being silly about it, we have, we have to try things. We, uh, we, we have to do our best job and help. I was just at a meeting this morning. I'm a member of the United Way Board here in the uh, Twin Cities, and a friend of mine, uh, a wonderful woman who heads up uh, it's the equivalent of Minneapolis's uh, Harlem's, Harlem uh, Children's Zone, where there are these wraparound services around uh, school activities. And she just picked up, her organization just picked up a $28 million federal grant. They are wonderfully organized. She is wonderfully smart and dedicated, as well as the people around her. God, I wish and I hope she succeeds in, in big time ways. But the out of wedlock birth rate on the north side of Minneapolis, where this program focuses, is immense. Hennepin County is, uh, is where Minneapolis is, or Minneapolis is in Hennepin County. The out of wedlock birth rate for the African American community here is 84 plus percent. And I wish it were otherwise, but I don't know of any. Uh, reforms, any uh, activities, any projects, any approaches that will adequately compensate for that. So that seems to lead a little bit to this dilemma, right? I mean, the dilemma being, if this is not an educational problem, but it's a social and cultural problem, um, to what degree should schools be solving it? How do you grapple with that? Well, I'm not willing to say that uh, the entirety of the problem is social, cultural, familial, and all. There are still a lot of things, and just about everybody who is hooked up uh, to the show right now, they have uh, their favorite things, or the la really their least favorite things about uh, American education that they can that they can point to. The good news, in a real way is that there are indeed some terrific programs out there. I point to the KIPP Academies, the one I was finishing off the book early last year. There was a grand total of 99. That's all uh, across the country. I'm a great proponent of 
uh, vouchers and school choice programs that uh, include parochial schools, and many of them do a great job with low-income uh, kids. So we can make progress in, in certain areas, but one of the arguments, again, of the book is that there is this expectation we can bring great programs like those to adequate scale on a consistent basis, and I just don't think so for a variety of reasons. Well, this was an interesting dilemma for me. Your, your wife is an ordained minister, am I right? That's correct. So I think it's it's uh, we can assume that for you a part of the answer to this is uh, religious or um, you know would focus on the uh, social and um, a sort of non-educational aspects of family. Would that be fair? Absolutely. I'm uh, more than a policy person. I'm a I'm a culturalist, and without taking this too far. A field, uh, you may remember in the book I talked about what a horrible high school student I was and what a horrible junior high school student I was. And I try to tell folks it was because I worked so hard in uh, sixth grade I burned out. And people don't buy it, and they're right in not buying it. The fact of the matter is that something was troubling me without getting, again, silly about it. Or maybe I was just lazy and I procrastinated enough. And the point is there wasn't anything that the President of the United States, the Congress could have done. The governor of New York, when I was growing up there, Nelson Rockefeller, the mayor of New York, the superintendents, there wasn't anything that they could have done to get me to do my homework. To me, that is just a classic example of the limits of, uh, of policy. Other things are, are going on. And if we have problems as well, such as uh, uh, the fear that uh, many African-American kids, and not just African-American kids, have about uh, acting white or being seen as acting white uh, if they are working hard or thought to be working hard in school. I would argue uh, and do that those cultural disincentives are stronger than any uh, policy incentive uh, can possibly be, generally speaking. So, so what do what can we do? I mean, I, I find this a sort of a fascinating topic because, um, you know, the conclusion that I come to is, at least for me personally, is that this is less about kind of traditional school reforms than it is about thinking about the larger social cultural issues. And I and I wonder. Uh, what advice are you giving people who say, I really want to make a difference in student-child achievement? Well, first of all, uh, as I, I've said, uh, I do favor some educational approaches over others. So if we had real life voucher programs here that included parochial schools, uh, private schools, religious schools, I think many kids, not all by any stretch, uh, would be well served by that. Um, the problem is that uh, where's the leverage? Where's the leverage in in changing the culture? Uh, a variation on on the theme. Bill Raspberry, the, the wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, was out here a long time ago now. Uh, Bill was a friend, is a friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. Though. And the question was poverty or something like it, and uh, someone asked, uh, where do you begin? And uh, Bill said it was a uh, good question, big problem, and because it's a big problem, you can jump in any place, and his preference was to start with the boys. And in many respects, that's um, where I start. Uh, one is obliged to come up with recommendations in a book like this, so I, I worked hard to come up with some ideas that just weren't hackneyed and all. But the boys become the men who women legitimately don't want to marry. So I think it's real important to think about ways, not by ignoring girls or women, obviously, but to um, better serve boys in, in school. Um, uh, and so um, what advice would you give there? 
the paternalistic schools again, uh, the TIP Academy schools, uh, religious schools quite frequently, though religious schools can uh, be of equal service clearly to uh, to girls. Um, I interviewed a, a nun out here a long time ago during some school choice activity, and she uh, was the principal of an elementary school. And uh, I asked, well, what's the mission of your school? And the answer was something like to manifest God's love in every child. And my goodness, that, that's a mission statement you can grab hold of. It's meaty. You, can, you know what it says, as opposed to any number of other mission statements in other institutions which can get kind of gooey. So again, for kids who are suffering, I would argue that for many of them, one more time, not all, that kind of education, that kind of nurturing, that kind of education where someone can hold the kid's hand and say, God loves you, um, it just might work better for them than some uh, secular uh, setting. Uh, I'm, I'm loving this conversation, Mitch. I really appreciate it. Um, and I am a technology uh, advocate um, uh, and someone who really who really finds the, the conversation around technology and education very interesting. I, I will admit that I actually kind of stumbled a little at your uh, descriptions of the potential of technology in the book because it seemed like some of the um, value that you ascribe to the distance learning solutions that we see come through in things like disrupting class were actually maybe a little bit in conflict with the kind of uh, in local parentis kind of um, place-based setting of uh, the school actually fulfilling some things that uh, the child doesn't have in the family. So how does that get resolved? You're absolutely right. I was very alert to that as I was writing it. Um, I've been persuaded, you mentioned Clayton Christensen, his two co-authors with Disrupting Class were Michael Horn and Kurt Johnson. Well, Kurt is a longtime friend out here, and Kurt uh, talks about how uh, online learning, digital learning, blended learning can uh, open up the world for kids who may know their neighborhoods and not much more than that. I'm convinced that uh, if done right, uh, online learning can help kids who are struggling. Uh, they will not be overwhelmed and, or they will not be bored. And I'm only guessing, I have a pretty decent sense of how young people are just tied into that world. I'm certainly not, as witness the fact I'm on the phone now instead of on the computer. I'll be 64 in May, which didn't stop me, by the way, from publishing a paper this week on, on online learning. So it is not necessarily my style, but I understand its virtues. And while it uh, does seem to be out of step with some of the more cultural, spiritual, uh, hands-on, uh, in local parenthesis themes I've been talking about, it's another example of how there are different ways of uh, serving kids. Okay, this is the point of the show in which we typically move to uh, providing an opportunity for Q&A. Uh, if you're in the audience and you would like to ask Mitch a question, he is not online, so he can't see the chat, but you're welcome to put a question in the chat and I will relay it, or you can also raise your hand. You're virtually raising your hand by clicking on that third icon over the hand icon in the participant window. And that lets me know you'd like the microphone and you can take the microphone. I'm interested in your reactions to what Mitch has said, to the, to the ideas in this book, and maybe uh, ideas that you've had about um, uh, how we think about and address some of these questions. Um, Mitch, while we're waiting for that, um, are, are we at a point in history that's, that's um, unique in another regard? Meaning, um, so I, I'm somebody who goes to church, uh, and, and, um, and that it's a very rich experience for me. But it feels as though um, we, we um, our, our scientific revolution and our spiritual lives don't always um, have a good explanation of each other, and that um, um, there are those who would describe religion as a crutch, 
and there are others I think who would say they're non-believers but they sort of feel like cognitively we were built for that kind of group dynamic. Um, when you're talking to a group that's non-religious, how do you describe the value of those religious um, constructs? Uh, there's no problem. By the way, when you use the term, uh, some people say that religion is a crutch. The, the great response there is, sure, but who says we uh, don't need a crutch? Um, what I have found, uh, I frequently finish off uh, presentations, speeches in this area by uh, citing a conversation I had with Bill Bennett, uh, back in uh, 1986. As it turned out, I started working at the U.S. Department of Education in 87, but in 86 I had no idea that I would wind up there. <clears throat> but I had been an editorial writer at the time in St. Paul, and I was interviewing him, and because I was an editorial writer, I could ask these big questions. So we were chatting, and his assistant, Pete Weiner, was there, and Pete looked at his watch, and I knew I had one question left, and I said, Mr. Secretary, it seems to me what we've been talking about uh, are not a bunch of programs and budgets and rules and the like. We've been talking about the very culture, which for me is a dotted line connection to things spiritual, religious. And uh, I said, how do you go about changing the very culture? And uh, he said it was a good question. I was pleased with that, and he'd been thinking about it a lot. And the best answer he had was that you say what you believe in your heart to be true, and you say it over and over and over again. And I, I've been using that kicker for, again, decades now. And there's a resonance in the room. People recognize that uh, one can only go so far with budgets. One can only go so far with policy making, that these are matters of the heart, the soul. I don't want to get uh, too poetic here, but uh, people recognize that. So that's so, so and I Peggy, can imagine the older folks are, they, the better they recognize it. Yeah. So Peggy George is in the audience, and she's uh, using multiple question marks here because I think she's anxious to hear your response. Uh, she's, she's replying to that remark and saying, don't you have to take what you believe in your heart and turn it into action? And then previously she had asked in the chat, um, are there specific solutions to the problems that you are addressing, and what can educators do to address the family fragmentation crisis? So I think Peggy's asking, what actions can be taken by teachers? Oh, goodness. Uh, I thought we were going in the direction there are various things that I talk about uh, in the book. For example, I, I'll get the teachers in a, mo in a moment. Um, but one of the, the great problems, uh, particularly for minority women, inner city women, and not just minority women, is that so many men are in jail. They're in prison. When they get out, they have records, they can't get good jobs, they can't build careers, and that is another way in which they are unmarriageable. And are there ways of helping folks cleanse their names after they have gotten out of jail and prison and gone straight for a number of years? Are there ways of, I don't want to necessarily use the word pardon, but let's use the word pardon, are there ways to do that uh, more effectively so they will become more marriageable in the eyes of women? Yeah, and we have to uh, we have to pursue that. Where teachers are concerned, I suspect my answer would be it's less a matter of individual teachers acting alone in this instance. It's more a matter of individual teachers in settings which allow them to um, uh, to be of greater sustaining, nurturing help to kids. It's, again, I am talking about the religious schools uh, more often than not. Or again, these paternalistic schools, having really nothing to do with uh, religion, these are public charter schools more often than not. Um, but the, the way we've been going about it, for the most part, focusing on, uh, this opens up a whole other area, uh, on a, a gooey multiculturalism, which really doesn't uh, serve folks, I would argue, uh, more often 
than not, but rather holding kids to standards and, and the like, being paternalistic, sweating the small stuff, as Whitney said, uh, I, I would argue, generally speaking, that's more effective. So there's a fascinating contrast here. Something missing. Right. Keep going. A contrast between uh, religious and secular schools in this instance? No, the contrast that I'm seeing is the contrast between outcome-based education and caring for the social-emotional needs of the child. And, um, you know, what you're describing are institutions that uh, respect the needs for that kind of structure, the, the parental uh, or paternalistic structure, um, as a means of getting to achievement, which feels to me is different than focusing on strictly achievement. Uh, it's, it's a fair point. It is indeed a, a fair point, uh, and this is an area where uh, there are some conservative themes intertwining with liberal themes about how to approach education. Uh, you, you raise a, a, a very interesting uh, point. Okay, so um, Jeremy wanted to know, is there a morality that can be taught in schools that doesn't offend anyone? Has such a curriculum been created? It's very tough. Uh, Gerald Grant, uh, one of my favorite writers, um, the guy who wrote um, The World We Created at Hamilton High, a wonderful book came out in the latter part of the 80s, uh, speaks to that, and I, I cite uh, Grant uh, on a number of occasions. But in a nation of more than 300 quite diverse uh, souls, uh, I think it is very difficult. And that is one more reason that I have long argued for affording parents and kids an opportunity uh, for wider choice, including private and religious schools. Carolyn has just posted a long post in the chat, uh, and I think you would agree. Uh, she says, I do believe you find thousands and thousands of teachers in public schools who work every day to provide nurture to their students. But, and, and you're very clear about your appreciation of teachers in the book. She goes on, but with class loads of 28 plus students, it becomes hard to give the personal attention the kids need along with covering the curriculum. Sure, I, I, I would agree. This might be a good point, uh, this notion of no excuses. Everybody is saying no excuses anymore. The left says it, the right says it. At the risk of caricature, the left says, well, if we just spent more money and got rid of racism, everything would be fine and dandy, and everybody would succeed, and no excuses. And the right talks about, well, if we just get rid of the, the silly stuff and get rid of the teacher unions, uh, we know what works. All kids will succeed. And, and my answer is no, because there are <clears throat> lots and lots of kids out there, more than we believe or fear, who, because of the chaotic situations in which they are growing up, and in this instance I'm talking largely about single parents, or no parent uh, situations, simply find it too hard to concentrate well enough, long enough to work hard enough, uh, long enough to do sufficiently well in school. And I know by making this argument, I leave the distinct impression of uh, making excuses. I leave the impression of lowering the bar or viewing the world through a therapeutic prism, and I don't like doing that, but it is true. And frankly, I have yet to find a single educator, maybe someone in your audience uh, might uh, disagree, but I have yet to find an educator who disagrees with me. There are lots and lots of very troubled kids out there, and the limits of policy, uh, when talking about big city school districts and the like, the limits of policy are severe. And this is where, for me, it's intriguingly kind of shifts the landscape and makes it very hard to categorize this in terms of uh, liberal or conservative. Um, uh, uh, in the chat, um, Carolyn is, is uh, makes the additional point that um, if you go out to most public school teachers, they're there because they really want to make a difference. And I think what I've heard you say in this interview and both in the book is, um, there's a limit to what policy can do, and, and a lot of these policy things actually work against that ability for teachers to make the difference they want to make. Right. I have truly the greatest respect for teachers and what they do, 
They are saving lives every day in large numbers, but the problems are such that uh, not enough lives are being saved. And I also uh, say, as I mentioned at the top, they have skills that I certainly don't have. I, the greatest respect for teachers. The, the book is dedicated to my teachers. Mitch, <laughs> what a fascinating discussion. Uh, as a courtesy to our guests, we do Thanks. finish on time. So uh, we're going to close up now. I'm, I'm clapping for you. Uh, I'm hovering over the smiley face and then clicking on the applause button. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I uh, really felt challenged by a lot of the ideas and, and am anxious to keep thinking about it. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for coming on the show, Peggy. And others are saying thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. You're very kind. You're very kind. I very much appreciate it. And uh, we'll carry on. Thank you, Mitch. Coming up on the show next week, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach talks about the connected educator, and Henry Eyring talks about the innovative university. We sure appreciate your being here or listening to the recording. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Mitch Perlstein. His book is From Family Collapse to America's Decline. The, econo the Educational, Economic, and Social Costs of Family Fragmentation. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day or evening. <laughs>